Hi gang! As requested, I'll show you how to make this small Wimshurst machine, step by step, using parts from around the house. The discs are two CDs, and the pulleys are even made of cardboard. The basic components we'll need to make are a support structure, two discs, two lower pulleys to drive it all and two upper pulleys attached to the discs, two shafts for the pulleys and discs to rotate on, a hand crank to turn the shafts, and two belts. We'll also need two neutralizer bars, one in the back and one in the front. And lastly, a spark gap, a capacitor, two collectors, and the wiring to connect them all together. A quick note first. This is the glue I'll be using throughout. It's basically a much cheaper alternative to crazy glue, available at hobby stores. It contains cyanoacrylate. The place to start is with the pulleys and then the discs, since together they determine the size of the overall machine. The discs pulleys should be a lot smaller than the drive pulleys. That way a single turn of the drive pulleys will result in many turns of the discs pulleys, making it easy to get faster disc rotation and more frequent sparks. Here you can see that one turn of the drive pulleys gives a little over two turns of the discs pulleys. To make them, use thick corrugated cardboard taken from a box, thinner cardboard, and shoelace for the belt. The shoelace should be no thicker than the corrugated cardboard. Use whatever's handy to make an outline for the bigger drive pulleys on the corrugated cardboard. Draw two outlines. Cut them out. Use one of the pieces you just made to draw a circle on the thinner cardboard. Draw it slightly bigger than the piece. Cut it out. Do this four times. Next, find the center of the pieces. The trick I'm doing involves drawing a square whose sides are the same length as the diameter of the pieces. Then lay a piece in the square and line up a ruler with the opposite corners of the square. Draw a short line on the piece near the center and repeat with the other two corners. You found the center of the piece. I'm using this dowel for the lower drive shaft. I chose it pretty much at random, so use whatever you have handy. I'll need a hole through the pulley that the shaft can go through, so I first mark it and then cut it out. The piece should spin fairly freely on the shaft. Next, mark and cut holes on each of the four thinner cardboard discs. You can make this hole bigger. You won't need to touch the shaft. Glue one of the thinner cardboard pieces to one side of the thicker pieces, and then glue another to the other side. And there's the almost finished pulley. I still need to make a way to attach it firmly to the shaft, and that's what these wooden bushings are for. To make them, I start by cutting some wood and drilling a hole in each one. Notice that I choose a drill size that gives me a fairly tight fit on the shaft. If it's too tight, then you can always enlarge the hole by running the drill through it some more, while putting pressure against the drill bit on all sides. There, that's better. Next, I drill some holes for screws and screw them in. Finally, I glue the bushing to the pulley. A quick test shows that it all fits together well. Now to make the discs pulleys. Notice that they're also made of the same cardboard, but each have three layers of thick corrugated cardboard and two thinner cardboard pieces in between. Remember, we want these disc pulleys to be much smaller than the drive pulleys. This plastic end cap seems to be about the right size, not too small to work with, and yet small enough. And since they're made the same way as a drive pulley, I'll skip to the finished result. Make sure they turn fairly freely on the shaft, but not so loosely that they wobble. Remove any painted label from your CDs. This is just in case it's electrically conductive. Here I'm using sandpaper, but do whatever works for you. Glue each pulley to a CD. CDs have a little ridge on one side. I'm gluing to that side. And here are the two finished discs with their pulleys. Next, we need to make sectors for the discs. You want an even number of them on each disc. I chose eight because the large size makes it easy for both brushes on a neutralizer bar to touch them at the same time. Something I'll talk about later. Since this is supposed to be an easy to make Wimshurst machine, I felt that was important. And since the sparks were good, it worked out. To make the sectors, I first draw a square whose sides are the same as the diameter of the CD, and carefully draw eight lines in the square that meet at the center. I then make a paper template of the sectors. I chose these dimensions since they give a big size while still having the sectors well separated from each other. Separating them helps keep the losses down. Then I trace the outlines for 16 sectors on aluminum tape and cut them out. You can get aluminum tape from hardware stores. You can also use kitchen aluminum foil, but you'll have the added step of gluing them on. With tape, there's less work. With the disc attached to the paper that I drew the lines on, I attached the sectors in place, using those lines as guides. And here are the finished discs with the sectors. The next step is to make the support structure. The structure has to be fairly rigid, so I start by cutting thick wood for the vertical supports, and then a good sized base so it won't fall over. And then I sand it all to avoid splinters. I then drill holes for the disc shaft and the drive shaft. Next, I clamp it all together with the uncut shafts in their holes to make sure it all aligns correctly. Then I flip it upside down to screw it all together, starting with drilling holes for the screws and then screwing it firmly with nice long screws. 
And now that I know how long they need to be to work with the structure, I can finally cut the shafts. Next, I need to make the hand crank that's attached to the drive shaft. Notice that the part I actually hold turns independently of the rest of the crank, a surprisingly easy thing to make. I start by drilling a hole in a piece of wood. Ideally, the hole size should be a tight fit for the drive shaft, but it doesn't have to be. That's followed by some sanding to avoid splinters. I have a brass tube from a hobby store that fits loosely over a screw, so I first mark how much of it I need, and then cut it. I then drill a hole for the screw, and assemble it all together. with good results. Note that it's a tight fit on the drive shaft, but if it isn't, then you can use wood glue to hold it on tightly. Now it's time to assemble all the mechanical parts. Notice that the discs shown here are smaller and more sectors than I showed you how to make. That was the first way I did it, and found it too hard to work with the neutralizer brushes, which you'll see later. The drive pulleys at the bottom need to be spaced apart the same amount as the disc pulleys at the top. I'm using these divider calipers to do that but a ruler, or many other things, will work too. Once I have the correct spacing, I tighten the screws in the bushings for the drive pulleys. They just have to penetrate the drive shaft a tiny bit to grip on firmly enough. The first belt I put on is pretty straightforward. Tie it tightly, and then trim the ends. Notice that the second belt is crossed. That's how the discs turn in opposite directions. This one kept coming undone, so I added a little glue. The last step for the mechanical parts is to fix the drive shaft in place. To do this, I simply put some tape on both sides. The disc shaft will naturally follow the drive shaft, so it isn't necessary to do that one. Next comes the two neutralizer bars. Notice that a block of wood on the disc shaft is what holds each neutralizer bar in place. First I drill holes that are a snug fit the size of the disc shaft, and then cut it, and then sand them. And they're ready to go on. The neutralizer bars themselves are made from clothes hanger wire. Really any fairly rigid wire will do. Then, using pliers, I shape the neutralizer bars so they can reach the discs from two sides. Once shaped, I staple them in place. Later I realize that the staples aren't enough and add hot glue. I'm going to be soldering the wire ends, so I sand off any coating. After some experimenting, the brush I settle on is a simple loop of 30 gauge bare wire. Thinner wire would be better, but that's all I had. You can get thin wire by stripping the insulation off stranded wire like this but I have a spool of 30 gauge bare wire. It has to be bare. Remove any insulation if there's some. Here I'm figuring out how long to cut it. And then I cut eight pieces, two for each brush. Twist each pair together. You'll end up with four pairs. Next, twist one onto the end of a neutralizer bar and solder it firmly in place. If you have heat shrink, then you can use that instead of soldering. Repeat this for all four brushes. Here I'm putting them in place. Notice that the loop of wire, or brush, touches the disc sectors and curls in the direction of the disc's rotation. That means the disc must always be rotated in the same direction. These are called collectors. And this is a capacitor. And this is a spark gap. They're all electrically connected to one long wire. Making all of them is the final step. I start by attaching a horizontal piece of wood to the front. For the collectors, I strip the ends of two short wires, as well as strip away a piece from the middle. I then cut a longer piece of wire whose size is selected to go from the discs, where the collectors are, all the way to where the spark gap needs to go. I also strip a bit in the middle for connecting the capacitor to later. I next solder the shorter collector wire to one end of that longer wire. Cutting and hot gluing some pieces of plastic together that I got from a hobby store, I then mount them to the horizontal wooden support, using more hot glue. Next comes taping the wires to this support structure. As a final touch for the collectors, I found the only way that works is to trim away all wires except a single one. That one should face the disc and be separated a bit from it. Next comes the capacitor. On a bigger Wimsource machine, this is usually two Leyden jars, connected in series. But they're really just two capacitors. Leyden jar is just the original name for capacitor. Since this is a small machine, we don't need much capacitance. So here I'm using a piece of a CD case with foil tape to both sides. The first step is to cut some foil. I'm using kitchen aluminum foil. Tape one foil to each side of the CD cover. Hot glue the finished capacitor to the base. I attach two long wires to the ones already in place. I'm attaching to the piece I'd stripped in the middle. Then I solder them to ensure a good connection. Lastly, I tape the other ends to either side of the capacitor. The best spark gap I found for this small machine was one with blunt, thick wires facing each other. To make them, I start with thick, bare wire. I got this from the wiring that's found in the walls in your houses. It's 14 gauge wire. Clothes hanger wire should work too. Make sure you sand the end so it isn't sharp. Next, I soldered them to the ends of the long wires I just put in place. Adjusting the spark gap is simply a matter of playing with the wires a bit. And that's the finished small CD Wimsource machine. But before trying it, some adjusting is needed. First, the neutralizer bars should be angled opposite each other. Next, rotate the discs so that the sectors on either side face each other directly. 
Then rotate each neutralizer bar so that the brush on one end is touching the middle of one sector and the brush on the other end is touching the middle of another sector. That way at this point in the rotation, the neutralizer bar will complete an electrical circuit from one sector to the other sector. Do that for both neutralizer bars. Also make sure the bars don't come too close to the collectors. Make adjustments to the neutralizer bars by bending them if needed. Next adjust the collectors so that the single wires are pointing at the discs and are fairly close but not touching. Lastly, try it out. If no spark occurs at the spark gap, make the gap smaller. Or if a spark happens somewhere else, like at a collector, either move the collector wire further from the disc or make the spark gap smaller. If still no spark occurs, check that the neutralizer bar's brushes are touching the discs and lined up as previously described. Air that's very humid will also prevent it from working. Another thing to try is to charge up an object using the triboelectric electric effect, like I'm doing here by rubbing this plastic tube against this face cloth. Then put the charged part of the tube near the disc on the opposite side from a neutralizer brush. There must be an unbalanced charge on one of the sectors for a Wimshurst machine to start on its own, but there's a chance everything's neutral. By putting a charged object here, you create an unbalanced charge. By this point, you should have a working homemade CD Wimshurst machine. Enjoy! Well, thanks for watching. Check out my YouTube channel, Rimstar.org, for more videos like this. That includes one explaining how a Wimshurst machine works, also a two-part series on how to make a Van de Graaff generator, and one on how to make a crystal radio. And don't forget to subscribe if you like these videos, or give a thumbs up, or leave a question or comment below. See you soon!